Christian Center. And today's live class is all about slavery in America. So we're going to focus on the story of slavery, but really look at it through the lens of the Constitution and through the lens of people, amazing people. So we're going to dive into this. We're going to examine pre-Constitution, colonial period, the Constitution and the connections to slavery in the Constitution, and then go all the way to the Reconstruction period, probably ending around 1880s, around that time period. I am really, really happy that I'm not here by myself. I get to have this great conversation with you all and with our chief content officer, Tom Donnelly. So Tom, I know this is a really hard topic for so many students to learn because it really can. This, the, the institution of slavery is so unbelievably violent and sad and ripping families apart that it's very hard for our students to learn. So why do you think it's so important that we all learn this and what are the stories that we should really hold on to to ensure that we're not just telling stories of tragedy, but also of resilience and resistance? Yes, thanks so much for being here, everyone. You know, I think that this story, it's, it's so important, the story of slavery in America, because it both exposes, you know, some of the, 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 the darkest parts of American history, which we shouldn't shy away from, that we should learn um, as painful as they can be. But they also include some of the most inspiring stories in American history of enslaved people fighting for their own freedom, of the anti-slavery and abolitionist movements in the 19th century, pushing for greater, uh, for emancipation and then freedom and equality. So in many, in many ways, it, it has some of the, 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 the darkest parts of American history, but also I think some of the most inspiring. Thank you, Tom. And that's a really good thing to remember. You can, you can see, we, it's really important to learn our whole history, our whole story, but, we will talk today about so many parts of the Constitution, but we'll keep a lens and an eye on the people and these amazing heroic stories as well. So as we dive into this and we look through, we should probably start before the Constitution and really understand how slavery started in North America and other, you know, South America as well, but really how slavery was in North America before the Constitution in the colonial period. And then why was it different here than before? Because so often you hear people say stuff like, oh, slavery had been around for years and years, but there's a difference when it gets to the colonies. So can you kind of give us that foundational story? Absolutely, yeah. So Kerry, it, it, it's totally true. Slavery is obviously older than the US Constitution. And so here in the American colonies, slavery itself is written into colonial law as early as the 1660s. So that's in places like Virginia, and the Carolinas. And by the 1700s, these colonial slave codes transformed slavery itself, making it inheritable. In other words, it's a condition that's passed down from mother to child, and it's a, it's a lifelong condition based on race. And so that's when, when you hear the word chattel slavery, that's what we have in mind. It's the idea that the condition of slavery, it's linked to race, and it's passed down from mother to child. Um, what we see as we get into the 1700s is that American slavery expands. And so just to give the example of a state like Virginia, enslaved people grew from just 7% of the population of Virginia in 1680, all the way to a whopping 46% by 1760. So slavery becomes a massive part of the Southern population and also to white Southern wealth. I mean, the last thing to note about this period, Curry, is that you know the story of slavery in America, it's not just a Southern story. There's also a lot that's happening in the North as we move later and later into in, in, later and later in the 1700s. You know, in part, um, what we see is, you know, with the with by 1776, with the Declaration of Independence itself, what we have is written into America's DNA certain core values that will be really, really important, key principles that are important to the fight against slavery in the decades afterwards. This idea from the Declaration of Independence that we're all born free and equal and that we get certain key natural rights just for being born, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. These key words would one, expose the contradiction between America's founding principles and the institution of slavery, but would become such an important set of principles to be used by later key voices like Frederick Douglass in the fight against the institution of slavery. The other thing we see in the North just shortly after the Declaration of Independence is the beginning of a push towards emancipation, the end of slavery in the North it's a reminder that we do have slavery in the North, not just in the South. So we really do have to have a movement towards emancipation, even in the Northern United States. And so we see Vermont and slavery in their constitution 
1777, a state Supreme Court decision and slavery in Massachusetts in 1783. And finally, Pennsylvania passes the first gradual emancipation bill in 1780, followed by Rhode Island and Connecticut in 1784. When we say gradual emancipation, we mean very gradual though. So when take Pennsylvania, for example, with that bill, people who are currently enslaved in 1780, they remain enslaved for their lifetimes. What the bill says is that their children, though, will be freed uh, when their children turn 28 years old. So we see the institution of slavery itself existing in Pennsylvania for decades upon decades um, afterwards. And I, I think that's really important that we understand this as a systematic um, issue in our country at the founding. But also at the same time, we're at this at the founding with the Declaration promising equality, prom landing on a principle of natural rights, that all human beings have the right to exist, to life, liberty, and happiness, and that no government shall take that away from them. And so all these principles come to this point, and it really feels like the energy around uh, slavery was coming to an end at this moment. They get to the Constitutional Convention, they're carrying all these things on, and Charlene points out that so many are also Quakers, um, and people that believed in the Quaker faith that you cannot do this to another person. They come to the Constitutional Convention, yet we still write things into the, uh, the structural constitution that protects slavery. So kind of give us the, how did they get to this moment? Was everybody at the convention ready to start walking away from slavery, that gradual emancipation? Or are there different groups that are seeing slavery very different in this country? Yeah, so I mean, at the Constitutional Convention, uh, you know, the issue of slavery is a key topic of debate, and we see delegates with a range of views on the issue. So I mean, just taking the delegates themselves, 25 of the 55 delegates to the convention held enslaved people. So slavery is critical to many of these delegates' wealth and to the economies of their home states. On the other side, there are key anti-slavery voices in the convention as well. For instance, we'll talk in a little bit about Pennsylvania's Governor Morris, uh, Benjamin Franklin as well. So we see a little bit on, on uh, we see sort of the debates, uh, we see positions taken on sort of both sides of the issue. You know, if you're looking at the convention overall, what we'd say is that the framers on the one hand refused to write the word slave or slavery into the constitution. They also refused to recognize the right to property and men. However, they did reach a series of important compromises over the issue of slavery enshrining protections for slaveholders in the Constitution. And also importantly, they left the big issue of slavery, whether to have it, whether to not have it, whether it be a slave state or a free state, to the states themselves. And so the issue of slavery itself, this is an example of federalism, where the, 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 uh, the Constitution is ultimately leaving that big question up to the states. And so when we talk about, we're going to look at these big clauses that are in the Constitution, but when we talk about, you know, the people that stand up against enslavement at the convention, and then the people that are standing for slavery in the constitution. How much, was it an easy compromise? Was this explosive? Was this, a, what, what was the level and the tenor of this? Because you, when you're looking at these studies and you're reading these pieces, you can't re always tell, was it something they're like, oh yeah, this slavery will eventually die out. We'll just leave it as it is now. Or were there people really fighting to end it and people really fighting to keep it? Well, you know, I, when, when the issue itself comes to a head, especially around the key compromises we're talking here, they're among the most heated of the discussions at the Constitutional Convention. I mean, very, very powerful, strident arguments made by especially delegates from the Deep South, like Rutledge from South Carolina, delegates from Georgia, really pushing for these protections for the institution of slavery. And then, again, people like Governor Morris, Luther Martin, standing up and saying, no, no, no. The institution of slavery, it's inconsistent with America's founding principles. It's unbecoming of the United States. It's evil and runs against natural rights. So you definitely see that. You get that from when you read Madison's notes. Great. And we were talking about earlier that um, I really liked Sean Malintz's book, No Property in Man. And you referenced that earlier, that statement. I think it's a really interesting one to read to talk about what power they put into the Constitution and what power they didn't put into the Constitution with these clauses that protect slavery. So let's bang through these three clauses and then we'll kind of dive into what what is the the instant pushback on these clauses. But one question before I get into these three that Colin asked last class, 
that is connected slightly. So there's a, there's one of the key reasons they come to the convention isn't to talk about slavery, is to talk about building a government for a country to work. And one of the big issues that we like to always talk about is Shays Rebellion. So people talk often about the mention of insurrections in the constitutional at the constitutional convention. Are they just talking about insurrections like Shays Rebellion? Are they also are some states worried about slave rebellions as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's both. I mean, really, to, to put it in, in context, it, it depends on where you are in the country. But that 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 word can take on different balances, both for serious concerns, depending on whether you're, you know, from Massachusetts concerned about farmers in Western Massachusetts marching on the Capitol and undermining government through mob violence, or whether you're slaveholders in the South worried about enslaved people, um, uh, you know, rising up and trying to become free. Awesome. Okay, so let's dive into um, these compromises and really unpack the words and what they really mean. Sure. So, I mean, there are three big compromises we see at the convention. One is the three over the three fifths clause. Another is over the fugitive slave clause. The final is over the international slave trade. In many ways, perhaps the one with the greatest practical importance for American politics is the three fifths compromise. So this three fifths clause that we see here. The issue here is just to remind you, the U.S. House of Representatives draws up districts based on a state's population. So the more populous your state is, the more people that it has, the more representatives they get in the House of Representatives. And of course, the more representatives you have in Congress, the more political power you have. And so each state and each region is looking to have as many seats as possible in this new Congress. And so this gives rise to the question of how do we account enslaved people for purposes of congressional representation? How do we count enslaved people for determining how many representatives each state gets in the U.S. House of Representatives? We see arguments first from the slaveholders at the convention, those delegates, saying that, you know, in the end, we think that enslaved people should count as a full person, as five-fifths of a, a person. We may not treat them that way. We may not grant them rights, any sorts of protections, but we think we should get a boost in our political power based on how many people we hold in enslavement. On the flip side, we see anti-slavery delegates at the convention shouting hypocrisy, saying, you know, we certainly believe that enslaved African-Americans are full people, but you don't treat them that way. As a result, we think for purposes of how many seats you get in the House of Representatives, you should get no bonus. You should get no additional political power based on how many enslaved people you hold. Therefore, we think enslaved people, just for purposes of the of, of representation, should count as zero-fifths of a person. We think they're five-fifths. We think they're full people. But we think that you shouldn't get a political bonus in the U.S. House of Representatives. In the end, the delegates compromise and say, we're going to count enslaved people as three-fifths of a person for purposes of congressional representation, this ends up having real practical effects over time. It ripples at ripples throughout American politics because it ends up boosting slaveholding power in the U.S. House of Representatives, which in turn boosts the, uh, the their power in the Electoral College because the number of votes you get in the Electoral College, which votes for president, is based on how many seats in Congress you have. And finally, that will shape who becomes president and who ultimately selects who is going to end up on the United States Supreme Court. So this is a really, really important compromise. And Anne asked a great question. So how are they, count if they're counting enslaved people as three-fifths, how are they counting free Blacks? So they would count as five-fifths. Got it. So, it, and again, it's not, and it, I think it helps clarify that these, this is, this is for representation only. Um, it doesn't mean that enslaved people had three fifths of rights. So I think that sometimes our brains like to kind of marry representation with rights and freedoms, um, and it, but they're not connected in a dot. So that's really just taking a census and counting all of the people, but for representation because of that battle and fight, they're only getting a portion of that representation, but still a significant portion to change politics. Correct. Uh, Donald asked a question. Sorry, uh, we're just going to go down a couple of rabbit holes in this class today, but it's fun. Could free Blacks vote and during different time, early time periods of the Constitution? Yes, absolutely. And this is a key flashpoint in the Dred Scott decision we'll talk about in a little bit. Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney effectively says African-Americans can't be United States citizens because they've never been United States citizens. And then the dissents in Dred Scott by Benjamin Curtis and John McClain say, you got your history wrong, Chief Justice. Look, 
African Americans voted in various states at the founding when we were ratifying the Constitution, and there were still African Americans voting in five states on the eve of the Civil War. And so, yes, free African Americans did have voting rights in particular places. Fantastic. Okay, let's jump to um, we did the three fifths clause. So let's do the fugitive slave clause. Yes, the fugitive slave clause. It's it's a really important clause, but it ends up there's little debate over it at the Constitutional Convention. So this is the clause that gives uh, Southern slaveholders the power to go into Northern states and retrieve enslaved people that they say have uh, have uh, escaped enslavement. Um, and in part, a reason why there might not have been much of a debate is because this language is drawn from the Northwest Ordinance of, uh, of 1787. So they're familiar with, the delegates are familiar with this language. Nevertheless, this clause itself would be a major flashpoint of conflict between Northern states and Southern states all throughout the 1800s because many Northern states wanted to protect the rights and freedom of African-Americans and this free fugitive slave clause very much flew right in the face of that. Perfect, and the final big clause is the slave trade clause. So this, this clause is dealing with the international slave trade. It's a brutal, brutal practice that even many slaveholders by the time of the convention opposed. It's really only delegates from the deep South, so from South Carolina and Georgia, who still want to keep this practice in place. And frankly, you know, South Carolina threatens to walk out of the convention over this issue. And so you have certain delegates at the convention saying, no, this is our time in the Constitution itself. Let's ban the international slave trade. It's immoral. Let's get rid of it. This is our time to set new constitutional baselines. Then we have delegates from the deep South saying, no, no, no. If you do that, if you ban the international slave trade, we're out of here. We leave this convention and there is no union. We're all stuck with the Articles of Confederation. In the end, again, the delegates end up making, reaching compromise. They protect the international slave trade for 20 more years. But then on January 1st, 1808, so 20 years uh, after the ratification of the Constitution, they say Congress will then have the power to ban the international slave trade. In that ensuing 20 years, it has great practical effect. 200,000 additional people are brought from Africa to the United States and enslaved during that 20 year period. However, once Congress is finally given the power in 1808, it abolishes the international slave trade. Fantastic. Uh, so going through these is really important because we can understand where there's protections for slavery in the structural or original constitution. But it also, and Tom, you said this a minute ago, and I just want to kind of like hit it one more time. It also shows how the power dynamic really shifts and gives more power to enslaving states because they had that boost of representation um, in, in their vote. So it wasn't like direct representation where people are saying, I'm, you know, I'm listening to my constituents and my constituents are telling me this and I'm gonna vote the way they want. I mean, it's like people didn't have any voice and the people, the representation wasn't listening to them. So it gave people who weren't gonna be listening to them more power. So I think it's really important to kind of see how that played out because it goes to a question that we've had in class before. It took, and we'll get kind of walk through the pushback on this, but it took a bloody civil war to end slavery in America and then the 13th amendment being added. So it, how much does that have to play with how important is it that these th these big pieces in the Constitution embedded um, slavery in the Constitution, and how much did that play into how big the the reaction has to be to change the Constitution? So I'm sorry, that was a very convoluted question, but I think you get the gist. Yeah, but I mean, th those protections are really important, and it's why you know when we're talking about emancipation itself. So flash, you know, fast forward to eight, you know, into the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, and then eventually the Thirteenth Amendment. Part of the reason why Lincoln's going to need to use his war powers to issue the Emancipation Proclamation and free enslaved people in the slaveholding states is precisely because he doesn't think the Constitution gives him the power outside of the context of war to do that. He thinks there's enough protections for slavery in the Constitution that it requires him to use his war powers as president. Furthermore, it's why he pushes so hard towards the end of the Civil War and the beginning of Reconstruction to ensure that we amend the Constitution to be clear that slavery is unconstitutional in America. That's what we do with the 13th Amendment ratified in 1865. We abolish slavery, but we precisely need to do that because of many of these protections that we see written into the Constitution from the very beginning. Awesome, thank you, that was really helpful. Um, okay, so let's start talking about, you know, from the beginning, so even before the Constitution is ratified, written and ratified, 
You have people saying, this is wrong. We have a declaration. We fought a war of independence on these big ideas. And you have people instantly fighting back. So let's take a, a beat on two people from that time period. We'll start with Prince Hall and then we'll go to Ben Franklin. Yeah, so this is a reminder. The, so Prince Hall and Ben Franklin are reminders that, you know, the push for emancipation is part of the American story from the very beginning. So Prince Hall, the year is 1777, so it's the year after the Declaration of Independence is issued. He's a free African-American in Boston, and he offers a petition for freedom to the Massachusetts House on behalf of seven African-Americans. And basically what he does is he echoes the Declaration of Independence. And he says that those natural rights that we all get, that right to the, the fact that we're born free and equal, that tells us that slavery violates natural law and you Massachusetts legislature need to abolish it. We'd see in 1783, the Massachusetts High Court would agree and declare slavery unconstitutional saying it violates natural law and also the Massachusetts state constitution. So that's Prince Hall. That's a, a voice you know some of us know, but maybe is more forgotten today. But we also see Benjamin Franklin in these early years as a key voice on behalf of abolition. So he ends up emerging in the, near the end of his life. He turns to the abolitionist cause and he becomes an outspoken critic of slavery after the ratification of the US Constitution, publishes a bunch of essays and he ends up becoming the president of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society. And so as we heard from our comment at the beginning of class, the Quakers are a key force in the early push towards abolition. They're a key force to forming America's first abolitionist society there in, in Pennsylvania. And, and, and Franklin, in this capacity as president of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, issues a petition to the first Congress. And what he does in this petition is he calls for the abolition of slavery and an end to the slave trade, echoing again the arguments that we saw from Prince Hall's petition, saying effectively, slavery, it runs against America's founding principles and against natural law. It's time to get rid of it. And I think it's really important too, uh, and you've talked about this before, Tom, and other scholars that we recognize the change of behavior in so many people over time because Ben Franklin enslaved people and then became a powerful abolitionist towards the end of his life. And one of my favorite stories about what clicked for him in his mind, he went to an Anthony, I think it's Anthony Bray school in Philadelphia where all children were learning together. So all children of all races, all genders were learning together. And he could see the brilliance in all the children in the room. And that started clicking into his head um, about, no, everybody is the same and everybody has great brains. Now, I don't think it's as modern as maybe the way we understand it today, but still there was a change of understanding in him and in Lincoln when we get to Lincoln too, because I think that's really important to talk about. Okay, let's keep moving so we get to the Civil War. Um, but we were also talking about, you know, some people and one of our students asked in the chat, how, how can anybody with these three clauses, how can anybody call it an anti-slavery document? And that brings me very nicely to some unlikely bedfellows. So we've got a pro-slavery person aligned really strongly with an anti-slavery person. So do you wanna start with Calhoun? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, in the 1800s, we see big debates over the Constitution and slavery. And so we have, you know, some uh, slaveholders arguing the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. And they do exactly what, you know, you might expect. They point to the Constitution. They point to the, the clauses that we just talked about, those compromises over slavery. They say, we never would have joined the Union if there weren't, if the Constitution was not a pro-slavery document. Of course it is. And so that's key figures like John C. Calhoun, so key pro-slavery voices. But we also see parts of the abolitionist movement effectively agreeing with John C. Calhoun. And so here an example is William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and their fellow Garrisonian abolitionists who look at the Constitution and say, John C. Calhoun, you're right. It's rotten to its core. So they burn constitutions. They say people are turn, they ask, they tell people, turn away from this corrupt system. They call the Constitution a quote, covenant with death and an agreement with hell for these Garrisonian abolitionists. Solution was to turn away from the Constitution, turn away from politics, and try to inspire moral rejuvenation in America to turn American souls. So in effect, they agree with John C. Calhoun, the Constitution's a pro-slavery document. But we also see key voices on the other side of this debate. Perhaps the most powerful one is Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass begins his career as a Garrisonian, but he later changes his mind 
And in a famous 1860 speech, which you can find on our website, the Founders Library, Douglas read the Constitution's text as a, quote, glorious liberty document. And so he looks at key parts of the Constitution. He says the word slave and slavery, they're not in there. Furthermore, he looks at inspiring language, like the preamble beginning with its powerful words, we the people saying those inspiring words, the statement of purpose in the Constitution points in the direction of liberty, not enslavement. He looks at things like the Fifth Amendment's due process clause, which protects life, liberty, and property. And he says those words, they point in the direction of liberty, not slavery. And so in the end, what Douglas argues is that the Constitution's language is, quote, we the people. Not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people. If the South has made the Constitution bend to the purposes of slavery, let the North now make that instrument bend to the cause of freedom and justice. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, okay, so such powerful words, such powerful people. And that leads me to the next powerful person that was really at the end of the day trying to ensure that her daughters stayed safe and protected and she understood how the law was written because if she was an enslaved person the lineage goes through the mother and that her children would be enslaved so i think it's so important to when we talk about harriet scott to really understand the brilliance of harriet scott really understanding the law and understanding how to fight the battle because she understood how the law worked so we always talk about the Dred Scott case, but Tom, tell us the story about Harriet Scott first and how that case really energized the nation and exploded into a civil war. So, I mean, just as you suggested, Curry, Harriet Scott, she's an enslaved mother. She has two young daughters. And, you know, really what she wants more than anything is to make sure they don't live their lives as enslaved people. So she pushes, pushes to bring the family's case to court, effectively what they're arguing in court, the Scott family, Harriet Scott being the main driver, is that we should be free. You should declare, courts, you should declare us free. Their argument is, yes, we're enslaved people. We were enslaved people brought to free soil. Once we were placed on free soil, that makes us free. So they bring this case, it ends up before the Supreme Court and, and it's called Dred Scott v. Sanford. It's decided in 1857. The key Decision, the key opinion in the court is written by Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney. And what he says is, no, Scott family, you're wrong. And what he argues, what he concludes is that two big things. One, African-Americans can't be United States citizens. So that means you, Scott family, you can't be U.S. citizens. So you can't bring your case here in court. And two is that that in the end, quote, we have, quote, uh, we have no uh, the white people have, quote, uh, let's I'm sorry. Uh, African-Americans had, quote, no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. So it's an important statement about African-American citizenship and also the deprivation of African-American rights. But what's important to realize is he may be the chief justice of the United States, but his arguments don't go unanswered. And so, one, we already have the arguments that Harriet Scott and her family bring to court as to why they should be free. But many of those arguments are echoed on the Supreme Court itself in powerful dissents by Benjamin Curtis and John McClain, two important Supreme Court justices. But importantly, this case also reverberates all throughout American society and American politics. And so we see key voices, abolitionist voices, anti-slavery voices, criticize the Supreme Court saying that they got it wrong in this case. And in many ways, the most famous voice of all that attacks Chief Justice Taney and the Dred Scott decision is Abraham Lincoln, whose debates with Stephen A. Douglas, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, part of the big thing they're debating over is whether or not the Supreme Court was right when it decided Dred Scott. Lincoln said, no, the Supreme Court was wrong. And as we move towards closer and closer to the Civil War, we know that Lincoln would emerge as the candidate of America's first major anti-slavery party, the Republican Party. And in the election of 1860, he would become America's first anti-slavery president. In response, we see Southern states leave the unions through secession and the beginning of the Civil War. Okay, Tom, real quick side question, because there was a little bit of confusion about why they would, the freedom suits, like what was the basis of the freedom suits? And Colin brought up Oni Judge, so perfect, great story to read on Oni Judge as well. So um, when we talk about the Harriet, Harriet Scott um, and Dred Scott, they are enslaved people that are brought to a free state. And they are there for a certain period of time. If they are there for that period of time, th because of the state law, they then become free, correct? Yes, that's the argument. And that is the exact theme that Colin brought up about Oni Judge, who was brought to Philadelphia 
and kept in the president's house in Philadelphia by George Washington. George Washington would take his enslaved people. I believe he kept up to nine enslaved people in Philadelphia, which was free at that time. And he would basically wait the exact amount of time and then send them back to Virginia and then bring them back, which didn't count, which still should have been in freed, but only judge took her own freedom into her hands and ran away um, and blended into the Philadelphia landscape and people helped her. So I think it's a really nice connection between free states that fight for freedom and that we saw this resistance from the late 1700s to 1860s before the Civil War. So just to give some framing and reference, anything else you would want to add there, Tom? No, just that these sort of personal liberty suits were quite common. There were there were a lot of them. So um, uh, in the end, Dred, the, the Dred Scott case represents sort of a broader universe of people using the courts to fight for their freedom. Awesome. And I think it's always important. Like sometimes we pick one story, but they're showing a real wave of people trying to use the system to fight for their equality and freedom for all. Now, when we talk, when we think about the election of Lincoln, we also think of the beginning of the Civil War, the secession of the Southern states. Um, and that brings me to my favorite story. Um, and we're gonna talk about an enslaved person who fights for his freedom and really helps spark just this energy around ensuring uh, the fight for freedom, the brilliance, and just one of the best stories in American history. And we wanna make sure everybody knows this name by the end of today. If you don't already know him, you already may already be obsessed with Robert Smalls with me. Tom, tell us the story of Robert Smalls. Oh, Robert Smalls, it's an amazingly powerful story. He's born an enslaved person in South Carolina in 1839. And a little over 20 years later, he had won the freedom of his family and it was celebrated as a civil war hero. He would then emerge as a key political leader during reconstruction. But his story, you know, the, the, the most famous part of his story, it's May, 1862. So this is, you know, before the Emancipation Proclamation, but during the civil war, he's serving, you know, in the Confederacy in the Charleston Harbor on a ship as that ship's pilot. Um, so he's a very well trusted member of the crew helping to navigate the Charleston Harbor during the Civil War. His you know, ship is used by the Confederacy. It's heavily armed. Uh, he has a white captain and other white crewmates. They decide one evening that they're going to leave the ship and visit Charleston. They leave it in Robert Small's hands thinking he's highly intelligent, really trustworthy. And so they leave him there. But Smalls had been for, for weeks thinking to himself, you know, if, if, if the moment emerges where I can you know, sail the ship towards freedom, I'm gonna have, you know, I'm gonna have a plot in mind and I'm gonna be ready. And so what happens on the night of May 12, 1862 is that the white crew members leave the ship. Um, Smalls has then at around three o'clock in the morning, Smalls and other African-American crew members start up the ship. They start to sail in the Charleston Harbor. They go to a, a wharf to pick up some family members to join them on their voyage. And so then they sail in the darkness through the Charleston Harbor, through Confederate lines. There are various Confederate checkpoints along the way, including at Fort Sumter, the starting place of the Civil War itself. But Smalls has a lot of experience as a pilot. And so he knows the proper signals to give to the Confederate forces in the night to allow them to keep sailing. He also knows his own white captain well. And so he dons the captain's hat. He, he, he mimics many of the captain's mannerisms like crossing his arms. So in the dead of the night, he appears to be the captain, his true identity remains a mystery to the, the to the Confederates. And so what they do is they sail through Confederate forces. The Confederates don't notice that there's anything wrong going on. Eventually they sail through and they begin sailing towards the Union blockade, which is right there along the South. And in the end, they, they, they as they're approaching the, the, uh, the Union Navy, they lower the Confederate flag and the flag of South Carolina and put up a white flag to signal they are surrendering their vessel to the Union Navy. In the end, what, you know, so we see this as a great act of courage. Smalls also ends up sharing important intelligence about the Confederate forces in the Charleston Harbor with the US Navy. And Smalls himself would emerge as not just a Civil War hero for this reason, but he would also courageously fight throughout the Civil War, fighting many battles on the water. Eventually he would be promoted to a captain and he would take command of his old ship, the planter, uh, as part of the Union Navy. After the Civil War, you know, he would receive uh, money from Congress for having turned over this Confederate ship to the US Navy. And he then used the money that he got from Congress to purchase the old estate of his enslaver. 
And so we would end up living there in Beaufort, South Carolina. And he would emerge as a key political leader. In 1864, he was part of the Republican National Convention that renominated Abraham Lincoln. In 1868, he helped write the new South Carolina state constitution to write into their key protections of freedom and equality for African Americans. He'd be a key figure in the state House of Representatives and the state Senate. And in 1874, he was elected to serve in the US House of Representatives, serving five terms from 1875 to 1887. And so in many ways, Robert Smalls is emblematic of this amazing period of advance for freedom of, for, uh, of freedom and equality for African-Americans. During the Civil War itself, we see it with President Lincoln uh, weighing in on the side of freedom with the Emancipation Proclamation issued on January 1st, 1863, freeing all enslaved people held within the Confederacy. We see African-Americans themselves fighting for their freedom, both leaving their, their plantations and joining Union lines and helping the Union Army, serving in the Union Army themselves as troops, and then meeting in conventions reasoning together and sharing with the world what they thought it would take to create better constitutional baselines in America to really promote freedom and equality. And that would culminate in the ratification of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment ratified in 1865 abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868 wrote the promises of freedom and equality into the Constitution. The 15th Amendment ratified in 1870 promised to end racial discrimination in voting. And altogether, these powerful amendments transform the Constitution so much that scholars today refer to them as constituting America's second founding. And we see a burgeoning of multiracial democracy in America with African Americans holding office at all levels, African Americans like Robert Smalls becoming members of Congress, becoming governors, state legislators, justices of the peace, sheriffs. And we see African Americans voting in massive numbers. And so for a time, of an all too brief time, we saw a burgeoning of multiracial democracy in America until finally we saw the drawback with Jim Crow laws that would then turn away from the promise of America's second founding only to be renewed again roughly a century later with the civil rights movement. Um, that is an amazing story utilizing the brilliant story of Robert Smalls and the other men that you know steered that ship through all those enemy lines and there's like four guys in that giant ship steering it so it's <laughs> unbelievable like the odds, the odds and the courage, and then picking up their families and keeping going. It's an unbelievable, powerful story. And just one of so many stories of people who fought to ensure that our country had the changes in the constitution with the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment. And then like you said, the continued fight from reconstruction in the 1880s all the way through to the civil rights movement to ensure that those amendments were followed through with their intent to ensure that all people had equal access to the ballot, to their voice, to their equality, and to their freedom as well. So thank you so much for pulling that all together. I really just wish we could end after that beautiful second founding and, <laughs> and not have the downfall after that, but that's a really important time period to learn about as well. And what ended the reconstruction period and why, and then how we had to push again for that freedom and equality. So thank you so much for this. It was an awesome class, great stories, really unpacking all these parts of the constitution. And students, if you have any questions, you will be here for a little bit. And if not, you can always email us later. We're here to help. Thank you all. Have a great Thanks, day. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody. I'm gonna stop the recording. Thanks Colin.